we have a very special guest, Hamid DeKrub, who will talk about wills and trusts. You know, that's a subject none of us want to talk about, you know, dying, what are we going to do, you know, when we die with our personal belongings, with our real estate. And let me say this, I always tell people, failing to plan is planning to fail. And even though this is something that we don't like to talk about, and I think that you can tell us a little bit about this, death, when death occurs in a family, it does one of two things. It tears families apart or it brings them together. And the reason that it tears them apart to that degree is basically for one reason, failing to plan for your real estate, your personal property. So today we have somebody who specializes in this area. I mean, he does a lot of litigation in this area and he's coming on to tell our viewers what we need to know about wills and trusts and probate in general. How are you today? Good, how are you? Thank you for having me. I'm so excited, so excited. Tell us a little bit about yourself, So, other than you handsome. He is <laughs> fine! <laughs> well, okay. thank you. So, my name is Hamid DeKrub, um, as Ms. Evans said, and um, I specialize in probate and estate planning, and so I do a lot of transactional work in, in those fields. Um, part of my hobbies, I like to do Taekwondo. I've been doing that for 24 years of my life. And so. tell us about the Taekwondo. I mean, <laughs> this is a master word. This ain't no beginner. He's a master word, okay? Tell us about that. So I've been doing it for 20, uh, 24 years, and I've traveled the country. I've, I've done international competitions. Um, I was able to rank as high as number two in the United States in wow. 2018. I was junior Olympic gold medalist in 2002. And so I have... Um, so needless to say, he ain't afraid to fight for you in the courtroom, okay? <laughs> if he doing all this fighting, he don't mind doing it with words in that courtroom. That's but true. hopefully he doesn't have to get to that. True, what made right. you decide to go to law school? So um, I was inspired by my grandfather, who was um, a senator in Lebanon. And he was a senator overseas for over 20 years. Wow. And part of his experience through life and through his career, he went through law school. But the difference was is... He didn't have enough money to finish up his final semester. No. And so the scholarship ran out, and people who were funding him weren't able to fund him anymore. And so his dream was always, you know, to have somebody in the family become an attorney. And it just so happened that I didn't want to do medicine, you know. And so I said, you know what, law is something that really interested me. And so... But why wills and <laughs> why the dead? Yeah. Why? I mean, is it? Tell us about that. Why not a corporate criminal entertainment? True. You're so True. you know so handsome. Thank you. Thank so you. why not? Why that area? So one of the things that I like to do growing up, I've always been a very personable person. Okay. I've always been somebody who just likes to listen to other people. I like to help families, and one of the things that I like is to sort of give a positive light to something that may be ultra sensitive and not so positive in some respects, right? When we're dealing with death and we're dealing with incapacity, it's often a very sensitive topic. I have a lot of clients that come into my office and they get really emotional talking about this stuff and rightfully so. And like you said at the beginning, either if you don't plan accordingly, I mean, it can death can potentially tear families apart. And I've seen that way more often than not where it does tear them apart. And so what's my job? My job is to make sure to give people peace of mind and let them know that, hey, you're doing the right thing here by planning. You're taking care of yourself, things you've worked so hard for your entire life. You're also taking care of your family, and that's something that was passionate to me. So that's why I like to do more of the transactional approach to probate and estate planning. And that, that's important, especially when, you know, we talk about, you know, the average person now um, owns a home. Sure. Uh, if he's a working man or lady, uh, they have a 401k or sure. retirement. Correct. Those are major assets. Sure. And, you know, you work and you fail to plan who's going to get what. Correct. Where do you end up? In probate. Correct. Oh, boy. <laughs> probate. Yes. That's not where you want to be. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Okay. And why? would someone in a situation end up in probate like that? So typically speaking, if you don't have a, a trust, for example, or if you don't plan properly, um, then you'd end up in probate court. So you would end up in probate court if you don't have a will, 
or a trust. And also if you have a will, but no trust, because people often think that wills avoid probate court, but they don't. So anything that's part of your probate estate will end up in probate court. What does that mean? What does your probate estate mean? How does all that work, right? So if let's just say something happened to me and I died with, let's just say my house in my name. Okay. And because there's no joint tenancy, or there's no Lady Bird deed, which we'll get to in the show. Yeah, I'm too. so excited right? to talk about that. And if there's no trust, what happens is even if it's in a And will, you don't mean trust like trusting people. No. You're talking about trust the Trust legal is in doc. like the legal document trust, exactly. And if you don't have that and you own things in your own name at the time of your passing, then your family has to go to probate court in order to inherit the asset. What? Yes. So wait a minute. So let me get this. Um... I have a family. We, uh, they're very supportive. We're not mad at each other. Mm -hmm. We still have to go to probate? In addition, even if you had a will, you would still have to go to probate. Why? Because you have to probate a will. It's part of your probate estate. So a lot of times clients come to me and they're like, you know, Hamid, my, my father passed away and he left us his estate or he left us this house. And now all of a sudden, you know, we went to, um, you know, sell the property and the title company or the bank told us, you know, you're not able to because you don't have the proper authority. They're like, how do you get authority? They're like, you have to go to probate court. So they come to me and they're like, well, I don't understand. My dad wrote in a will. It's going to come to me anyway. But what if I don't write a will? I'm just so busy making that money. You yeah, know, yeah. I'm just, I die abruptly. You're how old? So I'm 29. Okay. You know, we just read about someone, I believe it was with one of the major, either the Tigers or Lions, that 27 years yeah. old, yeah. So and he died, and he was going to be a, ver a a franchise player. What about somebody like that? They just say, oh, well, that's for old people. Are wills just for old people, Not like me? <laughs> and that's a huge misconception as well, what? too. That wills and trusts and all that is for older individuals or people with a lot of money. That's so far from the truth. It's because if, well, to answer your first question, what happens if you don't have a will? The laws of the state of Michigan are going to tell your family members where your hard-earned assets are going to go and who gets what. Wait a minute. Hold on for a minute. So if I were married and I passed, the judge could tell my husband what to do with my property and I left a will? You're saying... I mean, I didn't leave. Well, you're saying that even though my husband, who is legally the head of my home, he, the judge could tell him, you're going to do this, you're not going to do this if we don't have a will. Correct. Not only that. Wow. Is, is the judge will make the recommendation that your husband may not be suitable to be the personal representative. Even though we were legally married? Correct. Correct. Because what if you got married recently? Okay. And your family or your children from a previous marriage have issues with your new husband or your new spouse. That's why proper planning is so important. And so the law tells you that your husband uh, is going to get a certain amount according to intestacy, right? And that's defined by statute as to the amount which is adjusted for inflation, of course. Okay, very good. Let's talk a little bit about what's the difference between a will and a trust. Great question. So think of a trust like a will on steroids, essentially. Okay. okay? And so and what do I mean by that? Essentially, th like, let's just say you have this pot, right? And this pot is your trust. And you have your assets, like your house, your, your life insurance policy, you have your bank accounts, um, and you have your businesses. So these are all right now outside of this trust. The whole point of this trust is to fund it by putting all your assets into this trust. Once this pot is full of all of your assets, that means you have properly funded your trust, meaning nothing is going to go through your probate estate anymore because your trust owns everything. Does a judge get to, to say what's going to happen in my trust if I were married and, and override my husband? Absolutely not. Because What? Uh, yep. And this is what you can do in a trust that you cannot do in a will. And this is where an experienced estate planning attorney can assist. And if I need to call, where am I going to call? Call the crew group. And what's that number? 313-401-4488. That's my direct line. 313 313- 401-4488. And so if my viewer calls you, what are you going to tell them about that? I'm going to tell them the importance of proper estate planning, the importance of avoiding probate court, which is one of the main differences between a will and a trust. Let me ask this question. Does it take a long time if I have a will to go through probate? That's a great question. Yes, it does. And why does it do so? Because there are steps that have to go through probate administration. First of all, when somebody passes away, 
people aren't instantly thinking about, well, I mean, some people actually are money right away, but most people are grieving, right? I mean, it's a sad time. It's, it's an emotional state of mind that you're going through and your family's going through. Uh, but for a few people who have their own personal agendas, but we're going to give everybody the benefit of the doubt here. So by the time that, you know, you start, you know, coming back to what to do next, um, you're looking at a couple weeks to a month into the whole process. Then you go into the bank, right? Let's just say you go to Chase Bank and you say, you know, I know, I knew that my husband he had a personal bank account here. Right. Can I, you know, and and I'm his wife, so I'm gonna access it, or I'm, you know, the husband and she's, you know, and my wife that died, and so I want to access her bank account. What do I do? They're like, well, sorry. First, we can't even tell you if your wife or husband, your spouse, had a bank account here. Next, what? Yep. Wait a minute. Hold on for a minute. We go to he goes to the bank. Yep. Every week he gets his deposit there from Ford Motor. I know he has an account. Yep. I can't go there and say, "Hey, my husband's dead. Here's the death certificate. I need his money." Nope. You cannot do that. Not even if you're married for seventy-five years. It doesn't what? matter. Yep. Unless you're jointly on the account. But even joint accounts, I'll get, I'll tell you, there's a lot of pitfalls with joint tenancy, and so. But so what happens is you go and they'll tell you, sorry, ma'am, I can't tell you anything about this. It's all confidential. So wait a minute. My, if I were married and my husband passed and then I need to pay the bills next month, yeah. you mean to tell me I can't go and he, are you serious? Yeah. So you know what they'll tell you? What? They'll tell you, Miss Evans, you need to go to probate court. And then what will happen then? And so you'll contact an experienced probate attorney. Such as? I meet the crew from the group group. Okay. And um, you'll go ahead, you'll give them a call or her a call, and you'll say, I need assistance accessing my husband's bank accounts. And they'll tell you, okay. Well, let me ask this question. Everybody wants to know. Sure. How much does a will cost? Yeah. So it depends, right? Are you going to do a virtual will by logging online and going through those websites and just filling in the blanks and paying a couple hundred dollars? Or are you going to do it the right way and pay a few more hundred dollars? What's the it? difference? So the difference is you get proper legal representation. You get updated law in the documents. Uh, you get somebody that you can access at all times to. So I can call you. For sure. So it's not like me going to some type of uh, Wheels R Us, say yeah. for instance, and just <laughs> plug in my like information. Like and then if something happens, I can't call them. Correct. And uh, although that there are ways that you can communicate with them, I mean, are you, you can only call them at certain times. You can't even really meet with them necessarily. And they probably won't go to court with you. Not only that, is it true that? And also, I've had it several times where clients have come to my office after they've done it on the willsrus.com, right? And they brought me their documents and I'm like, well, what about this and what about that? And they're like, oh, well, you know, the questionnaire maybe didn't tell us about this or didn't talk about that. And, and so I'm like, well, this is why, you know, sometimes, I mean, are you going to be cheap with your family, your livelihood, things that you've you've spent so much money on? But here, I'll tell you, let's just say you do go to willsrus.com and you save the extra two or $300, right? Here's what's going to happen. You're going to go to probate court and you're going to pay an attorney thousands of dollars in additional fees for the headache that's about to cause because of your wills RS. Because of things that they may own. Correct. So basically a, a general wills company like that or they're just trying to deal with the basic stuff. Correct. Not the really the nuances. Like say for instance, I put down I have a house, I have a car, um, I have a bank account, but I forgot to tell them about my uh, uh, wonderful uh, collection of baseball cards. Correct. I forgot about that. Correct. And I love them. And now I have a fight with my children on who's going to get that. It, that If that's omitted, then I'm going to end up having to pay a lawyer. So it's basically this. You pay now or you pay later. Exactly. And even with a will, and even in a beautifully, properly drafted will by an experienced attorney, when it goes through probate court, you still need to hire an attorney to help take you through that process, which takes about eight months to a year at times. Wow. If not more, because you have to publish notice to creditors. Your will becomes public information through the probate court. So a lot of my clients who become personal representative of a family member's estate who passed away, they'll call me, they'll be like, Hamid, I don't get it. Why is this person from Virginia calling me, asking me uh, how much my house is, the house for my dad was worth? Why are they doing that? Because it's all public information. So they look through the docket system and they see, oh, John Doe had a house worth $100,000. Let me see if I can, you know, maybe shortchange the estate and try to get it for cheap. And then they start calling the personal representative. Why do they do that? 
because it's public information. Wow. So in, they go to a Wills R Us, and then it comes times to probate the, uh, the will. Those companies don't come with you, but you do. Correct. And that's, that's important. And so when a situation happens like that, they're calling me every day. They want to buy my house. I don't want to. And that's because of the publication. But if you didn't tell me and we weren't able to tell the viewers that, a lot of people wouldn't know. But listen, which one is more flexible, a will or a trust? Great question. Definitely the trust. Now why? Because after the probate court process, the family inherits the assets that are left over. But if you have a trust, you can actually essentially quote unquote control from the grave. What does that mean, right? So you're telling me with a trust that you can actually control what happens to the assets even after your kids turn 18? If you want to, for example, say, I want to put them through college, I want them to use this money for college, or I want to make sure that their spouses, who I'm skeptical of, don't get a hold of that money. Wow. So you mean to say that you can make a determination if after, maybe I have young children, 15 or 16, I can dictate what will happen to my money when they get married, say at 25, whether or not their husband or their respective spouses will be able to share in that? Correct. You can, wow. Yep, and you can do it throughout their lifetime, for example. You can give them more protection. You can give it to them at 18, but that kind of defeats the purpose of a trust. And also, this is huge. Why it's more flexible? Because you can plan for minor children. People don't know this until it's too late. If a minor child inherits assets over $5,000, that minor child has to go through probate court and have a conservator appointed for him. What? Or her, yes. Wait a minute, hold on for a minute. So just because I give my child, say for instance, I give her my house, and you mean a conservator if she's under a certain age in the ages? 18. How? 18. 18. So if that happened at 15, they have to appoint a conservator? Not only that, is the conservator gets appointed through the court, which costs money. And then the conservator has to account every year to the court, which is fine because then you want to make sure. And the judge can appoint a conservator. I may not even know. Yep. And they can appoint a conservator who's who's going to just essentially be there just to make financial decisions, who will make money off of the estate and off of the child. And so what happens... So wait a minute. I don't understand. If the judge appoints them, is it the conservative free? Nope. Definitely not. Who pays them? The estate, and it comes out of the child's money. So wait a minute. If I have a house that's worth $100,000, and I have a 15-year-old, they, they appoint a conservator. You mean to tell me that the money that the conservative charges my estate comes out of the house for my daughter? Not only am I saying yes, correct, but in addition, the court also appoints somebody called a guardian ad litem. And a guardian ad litem... Who are all these? Okay, but <laughs> exactly. that's just what the law says, and that's huh? What they, and that's what it says. And so who are all these people? That's a fair question. A guardian ad litem is like the eyes and the ears of the court. They go out and they make the recommendation to the judge whether or not a conservator is necessary or if they're filing the accounts at the end of the year, they review the accounts for them. So not only is the conservator charging the estate money for billing their time, but the guardian ad litem says, okay, judge, well, I worked on this for a couple hours, and the guardian ad litem, the estate didn't have a choice whether to appoint them. The judge did. But, but you're, you're talking about, like, if I had a child and they're like a ward of the court, you, you, they don't have to do that if they had a dad do that. False. They do. Even what? if they had their mother. Yes. I actually... I actually so, wait a minute. That. Let's back up. So, I'm married. Mm -hmm. My child is 15. Mm-hmm. Uh, I die, they have a father yep. who they live with. Correct. A conservator and a guardian ad litem have to be appointed even if they're living with their dad? 100% yes. Wow. And yes. that money comes out of the cell of my home. Correct. So which is more private? The trust. And that's why? why one of the reasons to avoid what we were talking about is to have a trust because the trustee can manage the assets for the child up until however long you restrict them. And the trustee is somebody I know, right? Correct. And so so it, uh, the trustee can be a good family friend. Whereas with a probate, you're saying that there's a chance that a judge who doesn't know me can basically put a conservator as well as a guardian ad litem 
on my uh, will and I don't know them and I'm paying them these fees and they could do things that were contrary to what I would want. Correct. That's why it's so important to plan and have estate planning documents like wills and trusts. But even with a will, you, you nominate somebody. Let's just say if you didn't have a will, the court can also nominate somebody to watch over your child through a guardianship role. What? Yes. So now we're getting all of these people that come in that I didn't know that the court is appointing because I guess the court knows them and trusts them. And I'm paying out of my money, my hard-earned money, because I didn't have the proper plan. 100%, unfortunately. So, do you have to trust? That's, that's only if you're a millionaire, right? Wrong, again. Tell us about that. If you have minor children, you need a trust, as you just saw now. If you have people who are special needs individuals and beneficiaries, you need a trust. Because if you don't, and if you have a will or no will, and they inherit assets, they might lose their Medicaid. They might disqual get disqualified from any government assets. So what you're saying is, say for instance, if I have a child who is special needs, then I need to make sure that I take care of them separately from a, in a trust and not basically in a will. Is that correct? Correct. You Why? Know, because in a trust, a special needs trust acts like a supplement, meaning they supplement, the funds from the trust supplement the benefits, the government benefits they're receiving at the time. And so if not, if they inherit everything all at once, it becomes a lump sum. This lump sum inheritance disqualifies them from receiving any sort of government benefit. So wait a minute. Because I leave my home, that's maybe worth a hundred thousand to my special needs child. They can get disqualified from Medicaid. You, you can leave your home worth ten thousand dollars, and they can get disqualified from. Medicaid. What? Yes. So with a trust, it's different. Correct. And why? Because what happens in a trust is you have an independent trustee, which is an independent third-party individual who comes in and makes distributions on behalf of the beneficiary, not directly to them versus a will or without a will, it comes directly to them. They make on behalf to pay for those supplemental activities or supplemental needs in order to keep and ensure that the child is living a happy life. And you had indicated, and, and, I, and I cannot stress this enough, um, more and more people we now are seeing are having children who have special needs. Should they wait till they're 18 to do this trust, or should they do it sooner? No, of course sooner, because if it's not 18, then they're going to have to go to probate court. The family goes to probate court to um, administer the decedents, the person who died's estate, and then they have to go through probate court again to appoint a conservator and a guardian for the child. So I just had a lady, uh, a client of mine, a um, uh, nice young lady who came into my office who was very emotionally struck because her, her, her husband was deceased. And she was just so, so, you know, uh, emotionally, you know. So what would you suggest in a situation and, like and that? And so I told her, literally, you, you need to go through probate court on behalf of your deceased husband. You need to go through probate court on behalf of your daughter. Um, and you need to go ahead and spend, unfortunately, thousands of dollars. Are there, let me ask this question, trust. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be like a, a Ford or a Rockefeller. You can be a regular guy or gal. Correct. So let me ask this question. Are they very expensive? They're not. They're not. And that's a misconception as well, too. You're going to spend more money paying for attorney fees through your probate estate than you would paying through a trust. And that's why I use the young and the old example, because this lady, she was younger. She walked in and she needed in this, uh, she had to go through this whole process. I have older clients that have to do this. People think what's a misconception about a trust is that only the older individuals who are wealthy need it. No, I gave you an example where younger people need it, where younger people need estate planning. Those who are just recently married, those who are divorced, those who are single but aren't married. Wait a minute, there was a situation, and this is obviously, you know, not an everyday. The husband and wife just got married and they were killed in a car accident. Correct. What are their alternatives to wills and trusts? So, a great, great point. And so, a lot of times people come to me and they say, Hamid, is it necessary that I have a trust? I said, let me evaluate your situation because every situation is different. 
And so a lot of times I see a lot of clients that really just have their main or their only asset is their house. Right. And they might have a bank account or two, right? So what I do is I say, have you ever heard of a ladybird deed? And most people are like, ladybird, ladybird, who, what? Where, what, what? <laughs> I never either, what? So they were like, what is this ladybird deed or whatnot? So essentially what it is, is let's just say you own a house in your own individual name now, right? If you pass away, that goes part of your probate estate. So what a Lady Birdies does is, is, is it says this, I'm transferring the house from my name alone to my name for my lifetime. And upon the expiration of this life estate interest, there's special language that only an attorney who specializes in Lady Birdies can put in there for you. It goes to my son and my daughter evenly, for example. Wow. And that avoids probate court. What? So you know the special language and how do I yeah. get it? Call me, the Krub Group, Hamid the Krub, and I'll take care of you. So what is that number? 313-401-4488. Again, 313-401-4488. So with this Lady Bird D, mm -hmm. this applies to basically my only, my primary residence, or what about if I've got a primary residence, and i got a place up north or something, someplace in Florida. Can I put it all in that? Great question. First, if you have it in another state, we have to see if another state allows for that. Okay. Because there's only a few states in the country that do it. Michigan just happens to be one of them. Okay. Um, the next thing is the more properties you have, the more you start getting into the trust territory. Uh-oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. And, and, it's not, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means that you have to make sure that all of your assets are taken care of. But one of the benefits that are special benefits of a ladybird deed that help, um, is especially more than a will, is that a ladybird deed helps med avoid Medicaid estate recovery. And, What's that? And many people don't know until it's too late that if you're receiving long-term care benefits and you're over the age of 55 years old and you're on Medicaid, Medicaid's gonna come after your assets at the time that you after you pass away. And so a ladybird deed, because your assets are part of your probate estate. So wait a minute, let, let, this is good. You get, you get me a little confused. You're saying that if I have Medicaid, and they provide for me in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. They have a right to come and take my house. Correct. Why? It's called Medicaid estate recovery. Now, they don't tell you about it because they don't want to tell you about it. And what's the one way to avoid it? A ladybird deed. Why? Because your deed is avoiding your probate estate. Medicaid estate recovery, the law says they can only come after your probate assets. And if it's not part of your probate estate, then it avoids Medicaid estate recovery. And, and, and the truth is, is that there are a lot of people, because of the cost of private insurance, are electing to use Medicaid. Correct. And what we think, I thought too, that Medicaid was something that the government did for us because they just wanted us to be healthy and to help us. But you're saying that there's a chance now that if I elected to use Medicaid and I have a home, they can come after that even if I don't give them permission. Correct, correct. Now there's a few carve-outs and exceptions for hardship and things like that. But, but I'm just saying because I use it and I have a home, they can come in. Now, what if, what if I'm on Medicaid? Can I use this deed? Correct, for sure. It avoids a state recovery and so you can definitely use that deed. Okay. I don't, okay, and I don't have to tell them about it either. It's public information because the deed gets recorded. So it's not like you're hiding it from them. Okay. Yeah. All and right. So it gets recorded in the registry of deeds. Who are Register of deeds. Power of attorneys. Great, great question. So powers of attorney, a lot of times when people come to me for estate planning, they say, Hamid, I want to do a simple will. Everything to everybody is so simple. And then it becomes more complex the more questions I ask, right? Yeah. But then Let me just ask this one question. What's the length of the average interview you have? It typically takes about an hour, sometimes even an hour and a half, because of the amount of questions that I ask to ensure that the clients are comfortable. And people think that, oh, I came in here thinking it's so easy. And I, I ask them questions, and oftentimes they need to get back with me with answers to think about them because they're so sensitive. So it often takes about an hour, hour and a half, and I do free consultations. What? Free? Yeah. Correct. Free consultations. So I can come in and come and call you how? 313-401-4488, and I offer free consultations. And so I can call you directly and say, listen, and, 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 and get information, but... Don't call when you get sick. Call now. Correct. Exactly. So if I'm 
just newly married. Guess what? In addition to giving you a wonderful life, I'm going to make sure I give you a good trust or something that we can make sure that if something were to happen to me that I don't anticipate that you're taken care of. That should be on one of the things that people who are getting married should want to have. Exactly. And that's why I brought up that situation before. Young, old, rich, not rich. It does not matter. It does not matter. Trust and estate planning can benefit you in, in so many ways. And like you just touched upon it, those powers of attorney. People don't think about them too often. Why? Because powers of attorney. What are they? They're documents that avoid having family members go through probate court. They avoid guardianship and conservatorship proceedings. Because How? Because what happens is you select somebody to make your own decisions while you're alive but cannot make your own decisions. So let's just say if God forbid something happens, you get a car accident, right? Yes. And you're in the hospital. Yes. Right? And then you're married, right? And your husband um, or your spouse comes into the room and they say, okay, doctor, well, I'm going to make this decision on behalf of my spouse. And the doctor says, well, hold on a minute. We didn't see a power of attorney in the record. Not only that is... Are you the guardian? And they're going to say no. And they're going to say, well, even if you're married to this person, or even if you're that person's child, or children, or family, or close friends, it does not matter. Go through probate court and get us guardianship papers. Let me ask this question while we're on it. What is a living trust? So a living trust is a trust that you do while you're alive. Okay. That you fund during your lifetime. How do you fund it? And you fund it by retitling assets into the name of the trust. So you have this pot that's a trust, right? And you're transferring assets, so the bank account. Right now, the bank account that you own is Vonda Evans' bank account. Let's just say it's at Comerica Bank, right? Okay. So what, you do, what you'll do is after you do the trust, I give you a document called the Certificate of Trust. And because your trust doesn't need to be registered anywhere and it's private, all you need to do is go to the bank and show them the Certificate of Trust, which is a two-page I document. do. Yeah, you go, because I don't have access to your account. Okay. You go to the bank and you say, hey, you know, Comerica Rep, I have this Certificate of Trust please retitle my asset into the name of the trust. They'll look at your bank accounts and they'll see your two or three bank accounts or your one bank account and they'll say, okay. So then it becomes Vonda Evans Living Trust dated September 6, 2019. Now, they can't go on my money, can they? No, of course not. So if I decided to put my living trust for my daughters, can they go behind my back and get money out of it? Who's they? My daughters. No, absolutely not. While I'm alive. Absolutely not. And they not. say, well, it's living trust for me. I got, hey, mom's going to give it to me, so give me some now. It, nope. Uh, not yeah, only that, okay. is, and the ladybird deed as well, too, why most people love this ladybird deed option is because you're not transferring that property to your family members while you're alive, saying, okay, you know what, I want to avoid probate court, so I'm transferring it to my brother with me, so me and my brother own it. And then all of a sudden, your brother gets sued, and your brother gets divorced, and all of a sudden, they come after the house. And you're like, wait, 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 this was really my house, not my brother's. Well, too bad. That's not what the deed says, right? So what does this Lady Bird deed say? Hey, listen, I have full control during my lifetime. If I want to sell it tomorrow, I can, and then you guys won't get anything from it. But um, if I don't sell it and then I pass away, then you'll be able to inherit it. Now, if I decide to do a living trust, which I should do, you mm -hmm. know, before I get sick or anything, just to have them, what does the living trust say? So a living trust essentially says who's going to be your trustee. It's going to say who and to, who's going to receive your assets, how they're going to receive your assets, and it's going to plan accordingly. For example, what if one of your child, God forbid, predeceases you? Yes. And then do you want their share to go to your grandchildren, which is their child, or do you want their share to be redistributed among your other children? I start asking these types of questions that go into this estate planning, and then the clients often are like, well, I don't know, that's a great question. Or what happens if a catastrophe happens? And we've seen this time and time again where a family member, you know, the family passes away in, a, in like a, an, an accident, right? And so who do you want to receive your assets, your hard-earned assets? Do you want the state of Michigan to tell you who's going to get it? Or do you want to be able to be in control of that? Yeah. Now, let me ask you this, and we'll get off. Can life insurance companies deny a person if someone did die within two years of the policy? They can and they cannot as well too. So they can only if there is some sort of fraudulent misrepresentation to them. But typically speaking, they'll take you through like a barrier of you know questionnaire and they'll talk to you to make sure that you know this person didn't do this life life insurance policy and then you know some sort of history happened. Like what if you know they got murdered by the person who was the beneficiary? I mean it's happened before, right? So they do a little background check. They can't really deny it if it's completely legit because. At the end of the day, you can't tell when somebody's going to die. But there is, an, if you get a policy, there is a 
point where they can start to uh, do investigations. Is yes. that correct? Oh, hundred percent correct. And so this is why you want to properly plan. Okay, and that's what. And so, and then you said now the ladybird. How much does that cost? Just like a will. Okay. Just like a will. And so it's a few hundred dollars. It's about five hundred dollars, depending on the type of ladybird. What? Bird. Yep, and that saves you thousands of dollars in the future because what people don't know is time and time again, the probate court is gonna take a percentage of the assets you own if you died with a will or without a will. It's called an inventory fee. So they'll evaluate and they say, your $100,000 house, it's not like you're taking your house and you're physically storing it at the probate court for an inventory. They say, okay, your house is worth $100,000, we're gonna take a percentage of that. Wait a minute, hold on for a minute, back up. Now you, you do a little bit too much right here. <laughs> you saying to me that if I die with a will, the probate court is going to get some of mine? Of course. Why? Yes, because that's just And it's the way called an that. inventory what? Inventory fee. That's just the way that it is. Wow. So what do they do? So they take, they look at everything in my will? Correct. Everything in your estate. And they say, okay, your estate is worth $50,000. We want this much money. So the money that you're trying to save on avoiding to pay for a trust, which isn't significantly more than a will, depending on the type of trust, of course, you're actually going to lose it in the long run and you're going to lose your peace of mind and it's going to be a lot of headaches. Where are you going to go to probate court? What is probate court? What floor am I going to go to? Do I have to park in downtown? Where do I go? What documents do I fill out? Do I have to wait in long lines? Yes, two to three hours, sometimes a minimum. And, and then until you get to the line and they tell you, well, sorry, you know, you, you, you didn't, you know, state this properly and so and and the clerks there they can't give you any legal advice. Correct. Can they? No, they cannot. Okay, so you almost have to have an, a lawyer at that point anyway. Correct. So this con conception that we have that you know somehow the will is for maybe a working class person and that it's the best thing to have is really a misconception. Correct. So what do you suggest for somebody who just say maybe? works at Ford Motor Company, you know, they're a working person, um, they make, you know, combined family, and maybe they, they make $100,000, they own their own home, they got a couple of bank accounts, maybe 10000 something like that in each account, and they got two accounts, and they've got kids, and they've got kids that are going, uh, you know, that are in, uh, like, maybe high school, going to college, what would best serve that person? That serve? I mean, that person's estate seems like it's a trust estate because they have minor children and they have multiple assets. Now, they can also do the ladybird deed with powers of attorney, right? So you accomplish the ladybird deed, which avoids probate court upon your passing, but the ladybird deed is restricted. It's not flexible. It's just for one house. Each house has its own deed. You can't do ladybird deeds on your other assets. Okay. It's just one property. And then... So you do the ladybird deed on my house. Correct. And then the rest of the stuff, like my bank accounts, um, my car, uh, my jewelry, anything else, I put in a what? Either you put it in a trust, or what you could do is you can have a trust-based estate plan where you don't worry about the ladybird deed. Or if you don't want to pay for the trust, you can have the ladybird deed and do beneficiary designations on your bank accounts. Now, what is that? So a beneficiary designation avoids probate court. So if you want your family members to inherit your assets and avoid probate court, what you can do is say, I want to have control over this bank account during my lifetime. But upon my passing, I want it to go straight directly to my son or my daughter, right? And that avoids your probate estate, and that's through a beneficiary designation. So a lot of times, people with ladybird deeds, I tell them, you know, do this beneficiary designation on your bank accounts, but also, because that's also part of estate planning, but also make sure that you do your powers of attorney because your lady bird deed only kicks in when you pass away. So I don't have to choose one or the other. I can, seems like what you're telling me, and I don't know, I can do a lady bird for the house, I can do a trust for my other things, and in that way, no inventory by the probate court, huh? Correct. Wow. You can also do a trust for the house, too. And it all depends on the particular situation. Okay. So every client comes in, and they always say, I want to do the, most people say, I want to do the cheapest, most simplest thing. And then I start asking questions, and then their simple estate becomes more complicated. Okay. And so it's my job to make sure to put them on notice. But at the end of the day, I say, hey, listen, these are your options. And you're welcome to explore those options. Whichever one you want to select, you know, I'll be glad to help, whether it's a will, whether it's a ladybird deed, whether it's a trust. But nowadays, I'm rarely doing wills as much as I'm doing trusts and ladybird deeds. Wow. So you're doing a lot of those. Correct. So where do you file the ladybird? 
you file it at the register of deeds. So depending. Also, oh, it doesn't go to probate. No, it doesn't. Oh, good. So yeah. they won't know. And about I it. file it for my clients, so they don't have to deal with going to Oakland County. So you Wayne do County. that. County. Correct. That's part of it's part of the fee. Wow. Yeah. So, you know what? You have fulfilled your grandfather's dream. Thank you. Of helping people and providing this information. I'm gonna tell you something. I've learned so much about wills and trusts. Until I think that you know, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna refer anybody because if they call me, I'm telling them to call you. <laughs> What's that number again? Three one three four zero one four four eight eight. What are your hours of operation? So I work every day. Okay. Yeah, and so it really depends. When do I have court? A lot of times I have probate court in the mornings. Usually afternoons are more set for meetings, but there are times where I don't have courts in the morning. I do work on the weekends because you have to accommodate clients' schedules who work throughout the day and who work afternoon shifts. So I'm a, I, I'm a, I work at a factory. I work at a job. Hell, I, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer. I can't get out of here, I'm telling you, till 9 o'clock at night. Could you accommodate me? I, I, I can't get in there before 5 For you, Vonda, we'll make special exceptions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't course. say that for my kids. Like, <laughs> so I'm saying to you, do you make special accommodations for, sure. for people who, you know, they work so hard? Most definitely. And you do? Most definitely. And what's that number again? 313-401-4488. Listen, I am so honored that you came on. I cannot tell you. I've learned a lot. I look forward to you coming back. We can do, talk about something. But before you leave, just give us that number one more time. 313-401-4488. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And this me. has been Vonda's Law.